Wendell, are you okay live. with everyone? It's are live. You okay with everyone's bios? Yeah. Let, call me separately though, because this is live. I know. <laughs> <All right>. Hey guys. <laughs> okay, I'll call you separately. Okay. Yes.
Welcome everyone. My name is Anat Sultan Dadon and I'm the Consul General of Israel in Atlanta. I would like to welcome all of our esteemed panelists and more than 100 participants to tonight's event. We're pleased to see so many of you joining us from Atlanta, but also from other locations in the US. I would like to especially thank our partners in hosting this event, the Reverend Dr. Lawrence Edward Carter Sr. with the Martin Luther King Jr. King Chapel at Morehouse College and Dr. Sherry Rogers with the Spill the Honey Foundation, who has allowed us all access to a treasure box of history through the film, Shared Legacies. Those shared legacies are of great importance and relevance today, and I look forward to the discussion of the history, present, and future of Black-Jewish relations. <clears throat> well, Go ahead. I want to thank everybody for coming this evening. It is a total honor. And um, I want to thank a special thanks to Doug Wilker, who um, with AJC has been so instrumental in Atlanta making this film happen and uh, help with the little video that you're going to see tonight. And uh, I'm just so honored uh, by the Israeli consulate and the esteemed panel. Um, I, I just can't thank everybody enough. And I, I don't want to, I want, the film will, will go on tonight. And I'm just, I want to give a special thanks to um, Isaiah Thomas. I know this was a huge, uh, a huge commitment for him to do tonight. And what an amazing time since this is basketball has been right now so much about social justice. So we are honored and I can't wait for this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Everything all right on your end, Wendell? Yep, good to go. Cool. Uh, Sounds good. Good evening, everyone. I'm so excited to see every all of all these people on the call. We have over a hundred participants and some really great panelists um, during tonight's discussion, and we'll get into inter introducing them a little bit later. My name is Wendell Shelby Wallace. I am the director of external affairs for the Israeli consulate in Atlanta. Um, and we are so excited again to be joined with our partners at Spill the Honey Foundation and, and Morehouse College, King Chapel, um, um, for tonight to, to, to host tonight's event. Um, my colleague Blake will come on and introduce himself and we'll show you a brief clip and get things started. Hey guys, I'm Blake Weissman. I am the Spill the Honey National Youth President. I'm also a rising junior at the University of Michigan. Go Blue. We are so excited to have all you guys here. I cannot, I've been waiting for this day for a very long time. And now we're gonna show you a clip, a very, very sneak peek of what to expect in the future for this film. So Wendell, by all means. Never again racism. Never again anti-Semitism. By bringing people together, there's a sweetness that spills over that will change the nastiness and the bitterness of racism and anti-Semitism. That's what spilling the honey really is about. Just being able to connect with someone, I think nowadays who has similar um, interests and someone of a different faith and different background, I think it's very, it, it really changed um, how I see the world. And it takes true leaders. It takes true strong people to stand firm and say, no, we're gonna, we're gonna bring this together. And I believe in a 2020 time, this is truly that time to do that. We can make some real changes, some real moves and, and learn from each other in, 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 in such a great way. And it doesn't have to be the oppression Olympics about who, who was going through more pain or who continues to go through pain. Like, let's, let's, let's uh, 
galvanize our, our positive energy and our compassion and, and, you know, use it as a defense against the hate. Anything is possible from here, right? Because if we can survive all of these things and we can support one another um, in the future and going forward, then what else can stop us? It is incumbent upon us to arm ourselves with this weapon of love, which is the only power that can expose and drive out evil, bitterness, bigotry, anti-Semitism, and hate. How did you go from people who are just marching and expressing your frustration to becoming leaders here in Brooklyn? Just about everyone around here, we started seeing each other and started saying, hey, we're all here. Let's get our, each other's information. Let's try to actually plan things out in advance, try to get some food, build some connections with other people who are trying to protest as well. For a while, I used to sort of regret that I wasn't around in the 1960s during the civil rights movement because I wanted to be a part of something great. I wanted to be a part of the March on Washington. I really wanted to change my country and my world. And when I heard that quote from John Lewis, and when I read his book, and when I met with Dr. Clarence B. Jones, I realized that I don't need to go back 50 years because I can do that right now. As a Jew, I felt like I didn't have a choice. My people have been persecuted for thousands of years, and we know what happens when people stay silent. Because George Floyd, it started something, but we're not just going to leave it here. My grandmother laid her body in the middle of a street in front of a car so that a school would be named after Harriet Tubby. We have to come together. We have to understand each other. We have to know and, and appreciate these shared experiences that we all have to put all of our accomplishments on a pedestal. I got to learn quite a few facts about the Holocaust. But I think the main point here today was you can do anything that you set your mind for. You have to be the change to the world. You can't just dream about it. And Spill the Honey, I think it is going to be wonderful. It has a great message. Don't be silent. Help the world. You just do that. With this knowledge, with this understanding, with these experiences, we'll be able to uh, uh, spill the honey. We need your help. Join us as a Spill the Honey ambassador to go from studying history to making history. As Dr. King says, we can't wait. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we're free at last. I'm Ivy Coco, and I'm spilling the honey. Never. So that was our short clip that we we're very excited to show you guys. And now we're gonna transition into, well, first of all, just thank you guys for being here tonight. Like I can't tell you guys how thankful I am for all of you guys to, for being here and supporting us. Um, this means the world to me and you know everyone else that you know I've been working with. So special shout out to Dr. Sherry Rogers and Lisa Weitzman, they've been incredible. So moving on now, before we go to our first panel of allyship, I wanted to take a moment and address some of the current issues that we're, we're facing today. Um, you know, the last 24 hours have been, 48 hours for that matter, have been um, tragic to say the least. And we wanted to, you know, take a moment, especially for the burning in the Chabad house in, in Delaware and the shootings of Mr. Blake, we wanted to take a moment and kind of uplift everyone's spirits. You know, it's, this news is, is somewhat deafening. So um, now we want to ask everyone to take one minute and just write down one thing that they're grateful for today. So Wendell, if you please can go to the slide and Sean, if you can please play in the music, please. Thanks. Stuck in the middle of the sea. Use the chat box below and flood it with the chat box, not the QA. If you ever find yourself lost in the dark and you can't see, I'll be the light to guide you. 
find out what we're made of. When we are called to help our friends in need. You can't count on me now. One, two, three, I'll be there. And I know when I need it, I can count on you. Like four, three, two, and you'll be there. Cause that's what Take another 30 seconds. up and I'll pop it off for you as well. I am most certainly excited about the wonderful panelists that we have um, joining us today. Um, we'll go ahead and get started with the first section. Um, and we'll be focusing on allyship and talking a little bit more about what that means. Um, I hope that all of you had a chance to check out the documentary and the movie, um, which for me was truly inspiring. Um, speaking of inspiring, one of my favorite people um, will be joining us in this section. Um, her name is Michelle Friesman. I met Michelle um, when I was um, work, uh, when I was a student at Morehouse and also um, participating in APAC programming. Uh, Michelle was one of the lead organizers with APAC um, and she and I had a chance to reconnect um, when she moved to Atlanta and became an academic research uh, research coordinator um, at Emory University. Um, another um, exciting guest that I'm, I'm happy to have in this section um, is nor none other than my Morehouse brother um, Caleb Barco. Um, who's a member of Phi Beta Sigma Incorporated um, and also a recent graduate of Morehouse College um, living out in North Carolina. And lastly, we have Mr. Isaiah Thomas. I cannot tell you how excited I am to introduce you. My dad and I have been, he's been talking about you for his entire life. He's a, he's a Detroit native um, and I, I'm, we're the biggest fans. But besides that, Mr. Thomas is, you know, an NBA Hall of Famer, all-star player, coach of the National Basketball Association, um, CEO of the Isaiah Intern LLC and Imports. And now we're seeing the amazing work that he's doing with the ongoing civil rights movement. So very, very warm welcome for all three of you. All right, come on in. Awesome, awesome. Um, so I'll start off asking you, Michelle, um, Having worked with many college students um, in, in your, your former work and, and, and working you know, at a university now, um, what exactly does this allyship look like on a college campus? Thank you so much, Wendell, for having me, first of all. And I'm very appreciative of being here. Um, I think allyship on a college campus <clears throat> really looks like a relationship, a friendship. It is really built upon students starting to listen to one another and um, understanding where one another come from and the struggles that their communities face. I think though that although well-intentioned, many students start to want to try to build uh, coalitions uh, without first building those relationships and building those genuine understandings of one another and without an allyship foundation, these coalitions tend to be like a little more utilitarian and more focused on institution partner, institutional partnerships rather than 
partnerships amongst individuals. And I think it's so important that students focus on that one-on-one -on -one relationship building and building those genuine friendships. And we see success all over the country. I had the opportunity to work with students all across the country, including Wendell. Um, and you can see when they have that foundation, they start working with one another on each other's events. They, uh, they work together, they're hanging out together because they care about each other, not just because their institutions have brought them together. And I've seen this play out in various ways on college campuses. I've seen Jewish students being the on the front lines of BLM protests and attending BSU events. And I've also seen African-American students being the leaders of the pro-Israel community on their campus alongside their Jewish student counterparts. And it's, I think, really fruitful when you have those conversations starting those relationships. Perfect. Thank you so much, Michelle. And I, I, I can't agree more. I, I know a lot of the relationships that I have with a lot of my Jewish friends and, and even, even my African-American friends began um, when we came together for a common good. Um, speaking of, of friends, um, Caleb and I um, became close at Morehouse. Uh, when I was vice president, Caleb was on the Senate um, and we worked very well together. Um, Caleb, um, Congressman John Lewis was a role model to many of us at Morehouse and, and he was also one of your fraternity brothers. Um, he would also um, often allude to the importance of standing um, with our friends. Do you see the Black Jewish Alliance as a reflection of his legacy? And um, also, how do members of your organization plan out, plan to carry out um, John Lewis's legacy, uh, or Congressman Lewis's legacy as a whole? Um, you know, I, I think that, well, first, thank you for having me on this panel window. It's truly a blessing. Um, I believe that the uh, Black Jew uh, coalition that Brother John Lewis uh, created is a long-lasting legacy of the relationship between the two communities. Uh, I believe that so much of our history, so much of what we have gone through is the same and in many ways intertwined with one another. Um, when I think of allyship, it actually reminds me of a quote from the Bible that as states, wherever thou goest, I shall go, wherever thou layest, I shall lay, your people shall be my people. And that is the mentality that I believe that that coalition has you know, created. And I believe that coalition and I believe that sentiment of allyship will be a long lasting symbol of what he means to the community and what he means to this country. I also believe as far as Phi Beta Sigma goes, um, we first were really hurt by his leaving. Um, it shook all of us, but we just decided the best way to honor John Lewis is to continue what we've been doing. Um, Phi Beta Sigma has been on the front lines throughout the civil rights movement. Everyone from John Lewis to Hosea Williams to uh, A. Philip Randolph. In fact, you actually probably you actually saw some of those Sigmas in the uh, documentary if you had a chance to watch it. They were actually, pictures were in there. And we believe that having the right to vote is essential. So one of the things that the men of Phi Beta Sigma have done is that they said, Voting is, going to, voting is going to be one of our biggest cornerstones of our service to the community. In fact, not too long ago here in Durham, they were passing out masks and registering people to vote as they got their masks if they did not register already. You know, um, and this whole idea of getting in good trouble was an initiative that was started while he was alive of training men of Phi Beta Sigma to be social activists. And then as well as finally is Sigma on the Hill is when they train young Sigma brothers to go learn how the government works for, and they go visit members of Congress and they learn what it means to truly be a leader in a political space. And I believe by doing those things and standing up for those things, I believe that my organization will bring honor to brother John Lewis. Thank you so much, Caleb. Now I'd like to move on to Mr. Thomas. So, I, I'd like to know if you can if you can speak more on why you were compelled to speak at tonight's webinar, like why why you were compelled to come here, and why you think it's so important for the Black and Jewish communities to come together at this time. Well, this is a community that that's always uh, been together, and particularly uh, connected through sports. And uh, what what compelled me is when you when you look at my my sports and basketball tree. 
Uh, it really started with uh, John McClendon, uh, who was a former student of Naismith, but then it transferred over to Abe Saperstein, the founder of the Globetrotters. And when you talk about basketball and you talk about the sport uh, and what Mr. Saperstein meant to us in Chicago and his daughter Eloise, uh, the way they interacted with our community, the way we came together through basketball, the way we came together through sport, uh, we, we were very connected in the community. Now, how did sport transfer into the civil rights movement? Well, in Chicago, there's, there's Malcolm X College, uh, and I believe there's only one Malcolm X College in, in the United States, and that's in Chicago on the west side. And then there's Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King Boys and Girls Club on the west side. So the west side was, a, was a, truly a hotbed in terms of civil rights. When Martin Luther King came to Chicago, he moved four blocks from my house on the west side of Chicago. My mother marched with Martin Luther King, and also my mother worked with uh, Chairman uh, Fred in terms of Fred Hampton with the Black Panthers movement in Chicago. So we were always very politically active, and we were always activists. But in that activism, sport was always connected, just as it is today. And when you look at a lot of the, the owners of basketball teams, football teams, a lot of them are Jewish. When you look at uh, how sport first, particularly basketball, have first, one of the first, uh, the early signs in basketball, I think in the, in the 40s and 50s, uh, actually the Jews actually were some of the best basketball players and they were known to be quick and, 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 and shoot well, pass, had all uh, types of patterns and everything else that people copied and emulated. So uh, through sport, through civil rights, through activism, through wanting to be the best that America can possibly be, uh, aspiring for the American dream of equality, uh, human rights, civil rights, voting rights, we've all been interconnected. And uh, so what made me want to be involved is that I've always been involved. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much for your rich answer. Um, Wendell, I'll pass it off to you for the next question. Um, so uh, this question is actually for, for all three of you and, 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 and involves what we currently see. Um, do you think there are signs of hope for young people progressing the Black and Jewish relationship given the current conditions of the Black Lives Matter uh, movement? Well, I, I'll take that if, if I, I'm, I, I'm probably the oldest one here. <laughs> uh, so when you talk, when I, I am so encouraged by what I see in terms of uh, what's happening out on the streets and, and actually what's happening out on the world in terms of people coming together. And when you talk about uh, African Americans and, 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 and Jewish relationships that, that have been strained for a minute or two uh, in this country, uh, but when you go back and you start from where we, you know, when we started in this conversation in terms of the civil rights, none of us could have gotten to where we are uh, in this America without the help of our Jewish brothers and sisters. And where Black Lives Matter is at right now in terms of what I see in terms of the protests, the marches and everything else, it, it reminds me a lot of our Jewish brothers and sisters along with our African-American brothers and sisters. Uh, but everyone is out on the streets making progress, protesting. And I think this generation, your generation, truly has a chance to end systemic racism and speak to all the tentacles of it that oppress different racial categorized groups. So uh, I'm inspired by what I see and I'm very optimistic, even though it's turbulent, but I'm very optimistic about what I see. Yeah, um, Michelle, Michelle, what do you think as a, as a person who's been working um, with students recently, black, you know, black, both African American students and and also um, working with um, um, also working with um, with um, Jewish students as well. Yeah, I think look, there's a lot of tension at times, right? And we we've seen this crop up. We saw it crop up with the BLM platform when it was first 
Britain and we see it cropping up now. But I think where we need to, where we can glean some hope is the really important and tough conversations that are happening. Um, they're happening at Emory where I work. Uh, they're happening within the community that I was a part of uh, with students across the country. And I see so much hope in those con conversations and we have to lean into that tension a little bit. We can't be afraid of that tension. Um, I, I think it's really a disservice to both of our communities if we decide that it's not worth engaging one another because of some tensions um, and when there's so much that we could be doing and growing together. Yeah, perfect, perfect. All right, and Blake, back to you. Thank you, and then I have one last question for Mr. Thomas. I mean, this is, this is coming from personal experience as well. I mean, I've been playing sports. This, this is prefaced in, in sports as well. I've been playing sports my whole life name it and I've played it and based on, on your experience in competitive atmospheres whether it be sports business or the film philanthropic world what goes into building an effective alliance you know what it takes for teams to work I mean we've seen your highlights and you know winning NBA championships like how can our coalition the black and the black and Jewish community work most effectively as a team you know that this is going to sound uh very, very mushy and uh, very simplistic. Uh, when, but every team that I've been on, uh, it was always built around love. And, and love conquers hate. And, and that genuine love and, and trust that you have with your teammate that you can build uh, with communities of, of trust. And, and I, I grew up uh, poorer than poor. So there was the there was the poverty line and then there's the line below poverty. So uh, every poor person uh, that was classified, you know, in terms of their race, their religion, or what have you, we were all in the same community together and we all shared the same thing. We were poor and looking for food. <laughs> so and and through those bonds, right, through that through those connectivity of shared experience, there becomes a, a, a commitment of friendship. There becomes a, I get to know you. And not only do I get to know you, but once I get to know you, then I, I, I have friendship, I, I have emotions, I have that one thing that, that, that men were always afraid to say to each other, that, that I love you. And every basketball team that I played on, the, the teammates, we always would say, I love you, even to this day, even though we are, you know, named the bad boys and the Pistons and we won back-to-back -back championships, there's not one time that I don't get on the phone with one of my ex-teammates before the conversation ends, we will always say, I love you. And love is stronger than hate. So, you know, the, the, the simplicity of love builds trust. And when you're consistent with your trust, uh, that that builds that type of love, you know, but consistency builds trust, trust builds love. And, you know, like I say, it sounds mushy, it sounds simplistic, but that's the roots and the foundations of all my relationships and community. Listen, it can be mushy, but if Dr. King, and Dr. Bernice King embody that, then I'll take mushy any day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right. So, Great, Wendell, I'll pass it off to you. Perfect, so thank you all for, for um, coming into this section. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and roll into our next session. I see Ambassador Young has already joined us um, and will also be joined by uh, Sherry Frank as well, Ms. Sherry Frank. Um, and so I'll go ahead and, and provide a, a brief introduction um, for Ambassador Young. Um, but you know, before we do that, I do wanna take a moment to pause um, and reflect on the legacy of what I call and what many of us refer to as Atlanta, Atlanta freedom fighters. Um, let's, let's pause it just for a second and honor the legacy of Congressman Lewis, um, Reverend Joseph Lowry, as, as well as Reverend C.C. Vivian. Um, these, these gentlemen were um, quintessential to the work and the, the movement 
um, not just of, of what occurred back in the 60s and, and 70s, but what still is happening today. Um, so it's, it's really important um, that, that we honor them. And, and, and throughout this program, we'll, we'll be mentioning a little bit about them as well. Um, but having said that, I, I do want to take some time and, and um, introduce our, our next panelist. So I'll, I'll introduce um, Ambassador Young and, and Blake will provide an introduction um, for Mrs. Frank. So Ambassador Young is well recognized. Um, he has a lifelong dedication um, to service and it's, it's, it's been illustrated by his extensive leadership experience of over 65 years. Um, he served as a member of Congress, um, an African-American U.S. ambassador to the United States, to the United Nations. Um, he's also been mayor of, of Atlanta and, and of many other positions, um, uh, an ordained minister. Um, so welcome Ambassador Young. Thank you. And for Mrs. Frank, uh, it's my honor to introduce you. She is, she's been leading the American Jewish community uh, for 25 years as the Southeast Asia Director. And she is the founder of the Atlanta Black Jewish Coalition. She is also known as the soul sister of, of the Honorable Congressman John Lewis. And I am so grateful that you're here to share with us your wisdom. So welcome both of you. Awesome. Blake, you want to kick us off with questions? Yeah, I would love to. So let's get right into it. Okay, so my first question is for Ambassador Andrew Young. Um, hi, first of all. Uh, so the question that I have is, it feels like <laughs> we now have the greatest moment that we've seen since the start of the civil rights movement in the 60s. Having served as a young man alongside visionary leaders like Dr. King, C.T. Vivian, Joseph Lowry, and Congressman Lewis, what have you determined to be the most effective approach to working with those with different viewpoints? Well, I think that um, I was not ever involved in different viewpoints. <laughs> I, uh, I happen to have been born in New Orleans, 50 yards from the Nazi party headquarters the German-American boon in 1932. And in 1936, my father at four years old had to explain to me what Nazism and white supremacy, and, and he said very simply that this kind of white supremacy is a sickness and you don't ever get angry at sick people. Don't get mad, get smart. I had to walk by there uh, to my aunt's house, oh, two or three times a week. And he says, always be polite, never show fear, uh, and understand that you know that God made of one blood all the nations of the world. Uh, and they don't want to admit that. But that's their problem with God. And you don't have that problem. And so you, uh, you're going to have to learn to live with people who are different and who don't like you. Uh, but um, the one thing you can ever do is get emotional. And because when you get emotional and upset and angry, the blood rushes from your head and you stop thinking. And he said, just stay calm and be cool and don't get mad, get smart. Uh, uh, and uh, you have to, you know, and, and that's, that's, that was a four year old lesson. Uh, and then he took me to the movie to see Jesse Owens, the 1936 Olympics. And when Hitler, when Jesse Owens won the first race, rather than give him his medal, Hitler walked out and um, took all of his stormtroopers with him. But my father pointed out that Jesse didn't get upset. He just stayed cool and won three more gold medals. <laughs> uh, and he said, that's, 
don't ever let other people's sickness get you upset. He was a dentist. And he said, uh, the other thing is that in New Orleans, um, the dental supply houses uh, were largely uh, Jewish owned businesses, or at least the ones that we went to. Uh, and so it was, I grew up in a, in a community uh, that was bound together by common beliefs. I think the first really interracial meeting I went to with my parents when I was about 12 was the National Conference of Christians and Jews. Uh, and that was the first, one of the first integrated meetings. The other one was Planned Parenthood, which was founded by Dr. Alan Guttmacher, who happened to be Jewish. Uh, and so it's been a part of my life. Uh, and it has been a challenge sometimes with other people but never with me and my Jewish friends. Uh, I would not have been able to be mayor uh, if uh, people like Jerry Frank uh, had not uh, helped me get to Israel in 1966. And Dr. King was really concerned about this. And one of the things I was doing on that trip to Israel was trying to plan uh, a tourist visit of 4,000 black tourists going to the Holy Land. Mm. Ambassador, Ambassador Young, I, I do have to stop you because we do want to move on to Sherry Frank, but those were, that was a beautiful answer and I, I really appreciate it. So I want to move on to Mrs. Frank and ask you, as the founder of the Atlanta Black Jewish Coalition, in your opinion, how much of that alliance is alive today? And is there anything that students like myself and those participating in this discussion can do to strengthen the coalition? Like, How can we use the lessons you learned from your work and are still learning today because you're doing still amazing work? Well, I started at the American Jewish Committee in 1980. And in 1982, we formed the Black Jewish Coalition. I won't go into the details of how we formed it from the very beginning. John Lewis was was our co-chair and our inspiration. And it was a true partnership between the black and Jewish community. And we continued that coalition. I retired 13 years ago and Dov Wilker, who now runs the American Jewish Committee and his staff has continued to give direction and leadership to the black Jewish coalition. And it's alive and thriving. Uh, in, in our early years, we advocated for things like renewal of the Voting Rights Act and for the Martin Luther King holiday and for demasking the Klan. And, we marched together in Forsyth County and reenacted every five years under the direction of Coretta Scott King, the March on Washington. And, the, and every other year, there's a young leadership retreat, which continues to bring Black and Jewish young people together. Um, they, they see films together. They speak out against anti-Semitism and racism together. So the coalition is alive and well in Atlanta. And I would say anybody who wants to join uh, the coalition. There's no uh, entrance fee or, you know, kind of way to get in except to be Black and Jewish and an activist and care and call the American Jewish Committee and said, uh, hear me, I'm here, I'm in. I'm in too. <laughs> I'll pass it <laughs> off to uh, Wendell for the next one. Thank you, Mrs. Frank. So you, you spoke um, of, of Congressman Lewis, uh, Mrs. Frank, and and I know that both you and Ambassador Young um, had some pretty close relationships with, with Congressman, Congressman Lewis. Um, he was oft, often referred to as the conscience of Congress. And uh, you know, working across party lines, he had the strength of love to coordinate with people who disagreed with him. Um, in fact, you, you, as you mentioned, you work with him with, with um, founding of the Atlanta um, Black Jewish Coalition. Um, but, but you also um, were, were instrumental in establishing the Congressional Black Jewish Caucus. Um, given your experience, both of you, your experience with coalition building, what are some of the effective tools used to break through um, differences when, when, you don't, you know, when, when you don't see eye to eye with the other side? 
Um, I'll start. I'm Sherry. Um, first of all, the um, I left. The, I, I retired 13 years ago, and the Congressional Black Jewish Caucus, which I'm really proud exists, was started with the American Jewish Committee and under the direction of Dove Wilker, my press predecessor. So, so I don't take, take credit for that. But I believe the way to build coalitions is to number one, get to know each other on a personal level. We would have discussions like, you know, how Jews relate to Israel, how African Americans relate to Africa. We would deal with things like, you know, where are Jews in the community and business and politics and the arts? Where are Blacks in those communities? We would get together to say, what are your key issues? And for Jews, it might be anti-Semitism and assimilation. For African Americans, it might be redline bank, uh, redlining from the banks or incarceration. But we created a table to hear each other is other's issues. And the reason people call John the conscience of Congress is because he understood issues of his brothers and sisters. You know, we marched in civil rights together, but John marched for freedom for Soviet Jewry and spoke out. So we really celebrated each other's um, histories and we celebrated each other's challenges and were voices for one another. Thank you so much. Um, and and um, Ambassador Young, much of your work in the UN and as Atlanta mayor and, and as congressman was surrounded around peace building and, and, and you have often referred to Atlanta, um, you know, Atlanta used to be referred to as a city too, bu too busy to hate and, and you refer to it as, as this, the, the, the city of, of peace. Um, how can we continue to have these crucial conversations like the ones that, that, that you had and the ones that we want to have um, with people who disagree with us, especially in, in this cancel culture? Well, I think that the, <laughs> the, prop, the challenge is simply to listen to each other. There was one method that uh, I used to use, and that is simply to let people air their differences. Uh, and then at the end of them sharing their differences or different opinions, that each one has to give what is the thing that worries you most about your opinion. Uh, and you create a, a situation where people realize that nobody is, no, no opinion is set in stone. That basically human beings are constantly growing. And by listening to differences, uh, you, you learn more about yourself. And you learn maybe some, of, you have to admit some of the weaknesses of your position. I mean, but that's, that's not just black and Jewish differences. Um, we used to do that at the YMCA when kids got in a fight. Let them talk about what they're arguing about or what and, and, and learn to admit the weaknesses of their own position. That keeps you flexible and enables you to grow. Thank you so much. I, I, I think that is, that's very helpful for those who are on the call and, and looking towards hearing the, the, torch, the torch forward. Um, Ambassador Young and, and Mrs. Frank, thank you so much for sharing with us your time. Um, we're gonna move on to the next section. And, and while we're in the next section, um, you guys can go ahead and, 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 um, and, and, oh, Mrs. Frank left before I could, I could even get happen. Um, but we're going to move into our next sec section, but while we're moving into our next section, I want you guys to check out this poll that we're about to post. Um, and, and it has everything to do with what, what these folks just talking, just, just spoke of. And so, um, having heard from these two legends, how important do you believe the Black Jewish Alliance is now in the fight against systemic oppression? racism, anti-Semitism, and all other oppressive forces. Um, and we'll give you just a moment to answer that question and we'll move on to our next, our next section.
All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started with our, our next section. Um, really excited for, for this section. Um, and as we get ready for, for this section, I have to give a special shout out to the Chapel Assistants of the Martin Luther King Jr. International Chapel who are joining us on today's sec uh, today, during today's session. Um, the King Chapel Chapel Assistants have been in existence since Dean Carter, um, who you'll hear from at the end of today's session, um, has been at Morehouse College. And so that's for, for over 40 years. Um, so having said that, one of the one of the speakers that I'm really excited um, to introduce to to you all today um, is um, the Reverend Dr. War Raphael Warnock, um, who is a senior pastor at Ebenezer Baptist Church. I could go on and on um, about his accomplishments, but I will say that he is one of my Morehouse brothers, um, and is and was also um, chapel president when he was at Morehouse College. Um, so welcome. Um, Welcome, Reverend Dr. Um, Warnock. Um, in addition to that, um, I'll let Blake go ahead and take us away with, with giving us a brief, brief introduction um, to Rabbi Berg. Thanks, Mandel. So we have uh, Rabbi Berg joining us today. He is the Senior Rabbinic Chair for the Lynn and, and Howard, um, for the Lynn and Howard. He is the Lynn and Howard Senior Rabbinic Chair. Apologize about that. And he became the fifth Senior Rabbi of the Temple since 1895 in July of, of 2008. Uh, Rabbi Berg, we are excited to have you, both of you for that matter, and let's get to it. So I am, you know, I, 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 I love theology. I, I love stu studying the biblical text. So this part for me is really exciting. Um, I was in, in preparation for today's um, event. One of the things that I went over was l listening to some of Dr. King's speeches. Um, and his, one of his most famous ones um, was one of the last addresses that he gave out in Memphis, um, where he discusses going to the mountaintop. Um, and, and Reverend Warnock, I was listening to one of your recent sermons. It was, it, sermons, it was actually a eulogy that you delivered at um, the funeral of, of Rashad Brooks. Um, and in that funeral, you mentioned the text, um, and, you know, uh, speaking of, of, of also the Exodus text, um, in which you discuss letting my people go and discussing systems of oppression um, which, you know, which, which may, may, may be hurtling and, and hurting um, certain groups of people. Um, so the book of Exodus seems to be one of the, the strongest catalysts and motivators that connects the Black and the Jewish communities um, and, and has been since the civil rights movement in the 1960s. What is it about this text that's so powerful? Um, and, and, and do these beliefs, both of you, do these beliefs um, still help us connect today? Oh, wow. Well, great. Thank you so much. It's great to be here with you tonight. Um, and always good to be with Rabbi Peter Berg, my brother from another mother. And uh, we've been working together for a long time. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm always grateful to, to be getting in some good trouble with him. So, so we, we are people of the book. And Exodus has been a formative text. Uh, for African American Christian faith, um, we we didn't so much as um, we weren't simply converted to Christian faith. We converted the faith itself that was passed on to us. The slaves did an amazing thing. They received a religion that was different from the one that was being passed on to them. Albert Rabito put it this way. He said, by some amazing but vastly creative spirituality, the slave undertook the redemption of a religion that the master had profaned in his midst. And um, a, a big part of that was the centering of the text, the Exodus text. Um, um, Black Christians in America dealing with the issue of slavery have always tied Exodus to Jesus and Jesus to Exodus. And um, this idea of let my people go. Um, I often remind people in the, in the um, new members classes at Ebenezer um, that the whole biblical idea of salvation is rooted in the Exodus, that we in America sadly have so narrowed this idea that it's just this kind of idea of individual salvation. But in the most ancient biblical sense of the word, salvation literally is the broadening of communal space. 
its deliverance into the broad and spacious land. And one of my favorite texts is that one in Exodus where chapter three, where God comes to Moses and, and says, I have seen the misery of my people. I have heard their cry on account of their Egyptian taskmasters. Indeed, I know their suffering. It's a great text. I mean, it's a God, it's a God who's involved in the messiness of creation and, and redemption. I've seen it. I'm not the distant God who's disconnected. I've heard their cry. I know their suffering. And then God says, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians into the broad and spacious land. And so I, I think that the work of uh, Black faith in America uh, from slavery to Martin Luther King Jr., because he is a product of the tradition. We don't need to make him into such a singular heroic genius that we forget that he was formed by something. <laughs> he was formed by the religion that he encountered as a kid growing up at Ebenezer Baptist Church. Um, the task of that faith has been the broadening of the communal space at its best so that everybody can breathe. And, um, and that's, that's been the work from, from slavery to Black Lives Matter. We've been saying give, enough, give people enough space to breathe. And we've been captivated by this story. And we've read our story through that story and that story through our story. And it's hard to see where one ends and the other begins. Rabbi Berg, we, 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 and from the Jewish faith, how important um, is is this is the Book of Exodus to um, to making connections, not just with the African American community, but but other communities as a whole? Thank you. It's a, I love that question. I wish more people would ask it to me, and I'm I'm always so grateful to be on the door. Everybody on this panel, uh, Reverend Warnock, especially. Uh, um, always a pleasure to, to roll up our sleeves at, uh, almost every day and work together. The, the Exodus narrative is, is, is the central narrative uh, of the Jewish tradition and the Jewish people. Uh, in, our, in our worship, uh, all of our worship services deal with the themes of creation, revelation, and redemption. So there is no worship service that doesn't uh, include um, our, our discussing and analyzing this theme. Uh, Reverend Warnock, when, when you are with us for our annual uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. service, there's a, a piece in the prayer book from Michael Walzer uh, that uh, uh, wherever we are, it is eternally Egypt. And I, I watch as you, uh, we read that and I can see how powerful it is um, for you each time. Uh, the, the, the holidays themselves uh, all deal with the themes of, of the Exodus, Passover, uh, at the Seder where we recount the Exodus experience, not just because it's something that happened a long time ago, but because there is still slavery in the world today and we have an obligation um, to, to make sure that there is no slavery and of course all of our justice work. There's two, two um, incidents that, um, or, or components that I just wanna speak to ever so briefly. One that, that really speaks to me is um, the midwives, Shifra and Pua. Um, the two nursemaids who refuse to kill the firstborn. It's the first act of defiance of civil disobedience in world history, uh, mm -hmm. of speaking truth to power. So we look at that as an example and say, we have to speak truth to power. Um, when something doesn't look right and sound right, we have to stand up. That's our obligation. And finally, I, you know, um, the whole exodus uh, narrative is, is an extraction system. Pharaoh presides in every way over a system of extraction, a system where people of means take advantage of people who don't have means. And the entire purpose of the Exodus, maybe even the entire purpose of the Bible, is for God to dismantle the system of distraction. And we know that we still live under a system of uh, extraction. Racism in America is an extraction system. And we're, what we're seeing today literally today, is that the whole system of white sanctioned violence is being challenged and hopefully broken down. So uh, it is the, the essence of who we are. It's our, it is our story. Um, and, and our job is to, our obligation is to make it live every day. Thank you. Blake? Thank you for that. Now I want to pass it off to um, Reverend Warnock, uh, before, before we get into this, I just want to say that I, I watched your, 
eulogy for Mr. Brooks, and it was one of the most powerful eulogies I've ever, speeches for that matter, that I've ever watched. And that eulogy alone, I could ask you, you know, hours worth of conversations. I'm not going to now. Just want to say that was incredible. Whoever hasn't seen that, I mean, ridiculous. So amazing. So to get into this question, uh, I wanted to ask you, the film clearly shows the close relationship between the Jewish and Black communities during the 1960s. Dr. King, a former co-pastor of Ebenezer and one of the spiritual leaders of the Black community, had close relationships with many rabbis and Jewish leaders. Do you see his welcoming spirit as an inspiration for Jewish involvement? And how critical is welcoming that spirit today? Oh, I think it's absolutely essential. And um, there are many examples, but I, I think most often about Martin Luther King Jr.'s relationship uh, with uh, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. Um, they had a friendship and a bond. And uh, Rabbi uh, Heschel said that when he marched with Dr. King, he felt like his legs were praying. Uh, he said, you know, you know, legs are not lips, but when we, we prayed tonight, he said, I felt like my legs were praying. And I think that's the, the call that all of us have at this moment, uh, as we witness yet again, uh, as, as uh, Rabbi Berg put it, white sanctioned violence uh, on our streets and the response uh, and the struggle and a president who literally said today, as he heard that the NBA players were having a boycott in response to this violence, he literally said, I don't care. Um, and um, um, the, the call for praying legs, for praying feet, is, is the call of this moment, that we would all use our platform, whatever it is, uh, in order to push forward this vision of the beloved community. And so I think of um, Abraham Joshua Heschel and, and Martin Luther King Jr. And I think in our own small way, we're, we're by no stretch those two men, but, but uh, Rabbi Berg and myself, uh, are, you know, we don't just show up on these panels. Our friendship is genuine. And um, we pastor two historic congregations. He's the fifth senior rabbi at the temple since 1895. I'm the fifth senior pastor at Ebenezer since 1886. Uh, we're both the fifth pastor or, or, and rabbi or, or, or religious leader in our congregations. And um, we've been trying to take that work forward, whether it's responding to human trafficking, which we work together on, uh, or mass incarceration, when we convened a national multi-faith conference at our at uh, Ebenezer Church just last summer to respond to the issue of mass incarceration. And we're continuing to do that work. You can learn more about it by going to our website called endingmassincarceration.com. When you go to that website, which teaches congregations how to do expungement events like the ones we've done at my church and at the, and at, uh, the temple, where we're expunging criminal arrest records of people who have never been convicted of anything, or, or maybe they were acquitted, uh, or they or never stood trial. They don't have a record, and yet they have a record, an arrest record. Yeah. Our congregations and, have been doing that work together. And, yes. and, and, and speaking of you guys doing the work together, I want to plug in here, um, um, Rabbi Berg. Um, the Temple is Atlanta's oldest, oldest excuse me, Jewish congregation, um, and has a history of senior leaders with the spirit of social justice and, and fiery activism. Um, what is it that you think inspired such strong, unapologetic involvement from, from Rabbi Marx and Rothschild and, and, and Sugarman? And how much of that spirit do you embrace as, as a current leader of the temple? Um, uh, first, I just have to say one word about, about Heschel uh, because uh, he's so important to, to who we are. Um, uh, in 1965, Dr. King, calls for religious leaders to join this march from Selma to Montgomery, and um, Heschel responds. So, you know, everybody calls him a prophet. I think he would be horrified to, you know, no, no prophet uh, calls themselves a prophet. I, uh, and, and I think he was just doing um, what he thought was the right thing to do. He was responding to Dr. King's call because 
it, it was an obligation. It was the right thing to do. And that's why he said, you know, I felt that my, that my feet were, were praying. And at the 1963 conference on religion and race in Chicago, where King and um, uh, Heschel met for each other for the first time, um, Heschel followed Dr. King uh, and said at the first conference on race and religion, the participants, this goes back to your first question, were Moses and Pharaoh. And the exodus began, but it's not completed yet. So he really set an example um, for, for all of us. Um, in terms of the temple, um, it is such an honor to follow in the legacy of um, uh, the rabbis who have come before me. And we have an expression that we, you know, we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. And um, Rabbi Sugarman, our emeritus, beloved emeritus rabbi, my predecessor, um, um, uh, did so much for our community. And uh, Rabbi Rothschild during the civil rights movement. And um, here in Atlanta, we can talk uh, locally about the relationship between Dr. King and Rabbi Rothschild um, uh, because um, it was remarkable. We should never forget that in 1963 uh, when, when Dr. King uh, was honored with the Nobel Peace Prize and uh, uh, it Rabbi Rothschild helped to put together the first integrated dinner um, that Atlanta had and spoke on the dais and presented Dr. King with a gift. Um, and uh, again, never saw himself as a prophet. Um, he just did what was the right thing to do. Um, and and uh, that's the legacy of rabbinic leadership at the temple. And um, it's an honor and a privilege every day to be a part of this community in which um, uh, so many giants came before me. And this will be my last question or last question to, to both of you um, before we head to the audience Q&A sec uh, se uh, section of our discussion. Um, and, and speaking of, you all can begin typing your questions into the Q&A box and um, we will we'll either answer them live on screen with all of the panelists um, or we'll get back to you um, after, one of us will get back to you after the event. Um, so um, Rabbi Berg, um, Reverend Warnock, um, white supremacist ideology such as racism and anti-Semitism seem to exist as a, as a divisive evil um, among Black and Jewish communities. Um, we, we sometimes see, you know, um, people from the Black community making anti-Semitic remarks, and we oft, oftentimes see actions of, of racism um, that may surface from the Jewish community. Um, how do we reconcile negative experiences and in, in, in this recent disconnect that we may have seen um, with the need to remain such strong allies? You got to condemn bigotry wherever it shows up. And we have to be consistent. Uh, black people and, and all freedom loving people have to condemn anti Semitism. And we have to be full throated and committed in that condemnation. And uh, people with white skin have to condemn racism. And we have to recognize the ways in which they participate together. Um, there's a famous quote, and I'm sitting here trying to remember the pastor who, uh, but it comes out of the, the era of Nazism, where he, he says they, they came for the socialists. Yeah, pastor Niemöller. That's right, Martin Niemöller, thank you. And I didn't say anything because I wasn't a socialist, and they came for the trade unionists, and I didn't speak up because I was not a trade unionist. And it came, and he goes down the line, it came for the Jews, and I didn't speak up because I was not a Jew, and then they came for me and there was no one left to speak. We, we have to condemn bigotry wherever it shows up. And um, we lose a bit of our moral authority and credibility when we don't. Um, and so in this moment, particularly this inflection moment in American history, um, we've got to stand up for one another. Uh, the same people who engage in, in racism today will engage in anti-Semitism tomorrow and the reverse. The same folk who, who engage in misogynistic, you know, language today will, will come at the members of the LGBTQ plus community tomorrow. And um, either we believe in the covenant that we have with one another as the beloved community or we do not. And um, it's the depth of that commitment that I think is tested in a moment like this. And it gives us an opportunity, quite frankly, to stand up and, 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 and hold forth yet again 
a renewed commitment uh, to what Dr. King called the beloved community. The, the, um, the question was, was very well written because what you said is the key to what you said is white supremacist ideology such as racism and anti-Semitism. It's so important the way you said that. The root of both racism and anti-Semitism is white supremacy. White supremacists have a twisted worldview. Um, and anti-Semitism forms the core theology of white nationalism. Racism, anti-Semitism, homophobia, xenophobia, everything that uh, Reverend Warnock talked about are, are not separate strands uh, of hatred uh, for white ethno-nationalists. And you can't think of it that way. They are deeply intertwined and mutually reinforcing of each other. And we have to together be uh, equally reinforcing and, and work mutually in the way that we combat it because it's all it's all one and the same and I think that's why we're here today and um, uh, um, it's all about relationships and that's why our relationship Reverend Warnock and I it's so important and everyone on this call when when Reverend Warnock calls and says we're doing a press conference right now uh, <laughs> I, I'm there in 10 minutes. And when, when we're doing a press conference, Reverend Warnock's at the temple in 10 minutes. And that's the way it has to be because we have to stand up and call it out and speak out um, because it's all the same. Thank you, gentlemen, so much. Stay on. We're going to ask all of the panelists um, who've spoken to come on. Um, and we're going to head hey, in. I, I, I just want to quickly say that uh, my good friend Peter Berg didn't make that up when when the person who occupies the White House decided on MLK weekend to call African nations s whole nations, and along with Haiti, I literally did decide in a moment that we must condemn this. We have to do it now. And I'm, I made my way over to the historic sanctuary, and I asked Rabbi Berg, can you meet me there in 10 minutes? And he was there. This is what we do. That is spoken, I mean, that, 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 that is literally the epitome of what relationships look like. Um, and, and I think that um, our goal and that we have with this call and, and, and that as a consulate and, and the Spill the Honey Foundation, and most certainly in what reigns true at Morehouse College and King Chapel um, is to understand the importance of relationships and, and the importance of friendships. Um, speaking of all of our friends who are panelists, come back on, you guys can, can, can come back on via video um, as well as, uh, uh, Dr. Rogers and and um, and Council General Satanda Dawn and and our special person who will be giving us our great charge at the end, none other than the Reverend Dr. Dean Lawrence Edward Carter Sr. from the Martin Luther King Jr. International Chapel. So all of you come on. Um, we have some really great questions that are pour, pouring into the to the question um, uh, section. Guys, please use the question section to ask any questions that you might have. Um, we have we seem to have a really good question um that's come in come in from joseph walker um who is he says he is a sophomore um biology major um at morehouse um give us one second i'm actually going to bring joseph on screen um to ask his question joseph are you there let's see yeah. Coming on. I think he's gonna unmute himself though. There we go. Joseph, go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, can you all hear me? Yes, we can Perfect. hear you and see you. Perfect. So my name is Joseph Walker, as Wendell said. I'm a sophomore biology major from Valdosta, Georgia, and I attend Morehouse College. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all of the panelists and um, also the moderators for this delightful event. Uh, I believe that now more than ever, this is a great time to have this conversation. So my question is to any of the panelists, um, can you shed light on some of the modern day accomplishments that have been accomplished by the African-American and Jewish Alliance? Because I believe that there is a stigma in the United States that if a person of a particular oppressed group allies themselves with another oppressed group, then they are somehow downplaying the problems faced within that community or um, devoting their time elsewhere rather than in that community. So can you just shed light on some of the um, accomplishments with this coalition that we have? Well, I think we were, we, we've already shared some of it and, and um, 
uh, and just even between our two congregations. Last summer, as a result of work that we've already been doing, so over the years, you know, we've been working together on human trafficking issues. We've been working on criminal justice reform. Our two congregations held an expungement event where literally people showed up who had an arrest record. And we convened the uh, forces, the parts of our government, Fulton County government, judges, district attorney, uh, the public defender, the clerk. And literally you walked in the, in the sanctuary with a record and you left without a sanctuary. There's something in scripture about that. I'm when people are in redemption, I mean, that's I can't think of a more biblical thing to do. And then as a result of that work we've been doing and bailing poor people out of jail, talking about bail reform, last year we convened a national conference at Ebenezer focused on ending mass incarceration. And uh, as a result of that, we put resources online that are being used by congregations right now who want to do bailouts, expungements, but more importantly, speak to the fact that the land of the free is the mass incarceration capital of the world. That's just one example. And that's work that just two congregations coming together uh, can I'll do. Give, but, yes. I can give you, um, I can't put my, somebody is disabling my, be able to put my face back on for the, for the video. But I'll give you an example that um, is an older one, but a powerful one. When the Rodney King uh, verdict broke in California and all of a sudden there was burning and riots and Maynard Jackson was the mayor of Atlanta and he came to us and said, us meaning the American Jewish Committee and the Black Jewish Coalition and said, I need help. And within 24 hours, we had pulled together the ethnic leaders in the community, the religious leaders in the community. We had a press conference at City Hall and we literally diffused the tension. And at that time, some of the um, small Korean owned stores in the Atlanta University area were being threatened. And we brought together the black leaders we knew and the Korean leaders we knew and created a new alliance. So good people working together can really make an enormous difference. That was a really great question, um, Joseph. And, and, and again, if you all have any questions, please feel, oh, there, there we see, we see you now, Mrs. Frank. Uh, <laughs> um, those of you who have um, questions, please put them in the Q&A, uh, ask them using the Q&A feature um, on Zoom. You'll see it on both your phone. And if you're tuning in from a computer, you can see it there as well. Um, we do have some questions that are coming in. Blake, do you wanna? Sure. Um, this has actually been a question that is, has continually been, been asked throughout, I can't even tell you since, you know, I've been with Spill the Honey, and I, I guess I wanted to ask the panelists, uh, be on, on behalf of all my, all my friends and associates who have asked us in the past, you know, what is one key takeaway you've gotten from this film that, that we are sharing today? What is one thing that really sticks with you? Well, I think one thing that um, I took away was that people need to come together. As John Lewis said, if something is not right, if it's definitely wrong, you got to stand up against it. And that's what I saw in this film. When something is not right, it is your responsibility as a decent human being to stand up against it. And I think that we need that film now more than ever because we have seen a rise in anti-Semitic attacks since 2016, I believe. Mm -hmm. And if I don't, and if we all remember 2016 was one of the worst years for police brutality ever. And when something is not right, and when something is wrong, we all have to stand up against it. And I think that the film, you know, captured that and it kind of, at least for me, it reinvigorated me. It started that fire within me again, because I was getting very, very, uh, worn down is very exhausted and depressed about all the, the stuff going on in the media and just seeing like seeing people get murdered and seeing places of worship get burned down is not normal okay. that's not something you should be normal with and that film reinvigorated me i found my fire again in a sense when i watched it and i you know i have, I have to say this you know it's really it's truly an honor to be sitting um, here and having this discussion with folks who were in the film, you know, actually in the documentary, 
um, and knowing that there are so many of you who have actually been involved in the work. I, I spoke earlier about the Atlanta Freedom Fighters um, and there's a great picture that I remember. Um, and, and in fact, I, I had it printed in, in, in my office at one point. Um, and it was a photo of, 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 John, of, of Cong Congressman Lewis and, and C.T. Vivian, um, Reverend C.T. Vivian and, and Reverend um, Lowry. And also within that picture was, was Andrew Young. I mean, um, and, and so Ambassador Young, having him on this call um, is, is truly an honor. Um, and a privilege, and then also having folks like you know um, Reverend Warnock and, and Rabbi Berg, um, it's 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 a rare occasion that we have this opportunity to have these these Atlanta um, icons all in one space um, to be having this conversation with students. Um, so again, thank you so much for that, um, for, so much for your your contribution, not only then but but also right now. And I'd like to say something. I want to echo what Isaiah Thomas said about sports and love. When I came to film in Atlanta, Sherry Frank was so welcoming with the AJC and the Temple. And I really have to say Atlanta helped raise the funds for this film and having Congressman John Lewis and Reverend C.T. Vivian literally at the Temple. And I was telling the story the other day how I'm from Michigan and Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence said to me, you know, Congressman Lewis was supposed to come to my fundraiser here. He said he's going to go to the temple. There's a film there on Black Jewish relations that he has to go to. And can you imagine? It's just the warmth and the love. It's from the friendships from Sherry Frank and Congressman Lewis in the temple that it, how much it represented in history in terms of Rabbi Rothschild and Dr. Martin Luther King. So there's this love affair that it almost feels like an amazing basketball team in Atlanta with Ambassador Young, the warmth. So when I was interviewing Mrs. Rothschild, and she was telling me about her mother who went campaigning for uh, Andy and Ambassador Young when he was running for mayor. I mean, this goes way back. He says most people don't know about this long history. So I think Atlanta really is the model that the rest of the nation really needs to learn from because that's why Atlanta is just so amazing. And I just feel so blessed that they welcomed me in as an outsider to, to film them and, and just the friendships. It was just so easy and the love there. So I just hope everybody can learn from Atlanta and Dr. King's legacy. And we, we owe tremendous debt. I know all over the world, um, Jewish people um, revere Dr. King all over the world. So I just feel um, happy that I was able to, to honor him in this way by showing the love that the Jewish people have for him and Atlanta, really is the model. I, and, and, and on behalf of Atlanta and, and, and on people like myself who are history buffs and, and, and the students on this call, like we can't thank you enough, Dr. Rogers, for putting together such an amazing documentary that captures these, these treasures, right? Um, and the line of work that I do in connecting the black and Jewish communities and, and, and other communities. Um, sometimes it can be difficult to gather all this information, but you've done it in such an elegant way um uh compiling all this information and sharing we do have one 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 uh one more question i'll ask from the audience and again if you if you all ask any questions that we didn't have a chance to to respond to we'll, we'll try to respond to you via email or reach out to you separately um this this question comes from roy um and it's posed to mr thomas he says so what are your thoughts on on the the players boycott um is is basically is is this, do you see this as a move of of social justice and and how far do you think the players should take it and is there anything that that anyone on the call um should do to get involved in this type of movement well i i think what what the players have have done is is continue to to lend their voice uh to the the fight for um for equal rights um uh birth rights uh citizenship um you know in the u.s where we are all looked at as um uh, equal and and have an equal protection from the law uh, and ending uh, systemic racism where we talk about our educational system uh, our health system uh, our banking system and lending voice to that uh, you know what 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 are the next steps uh, for us right now we are organizing a uh, a group of us are, are talking about what what are the next steps, and how do you how do you start instituting policy, uh, changing policy, uh, interacting with with 
these different branches of government uh, to affect change and, and not only social change, but, but legal change and long lasting change. Uh, again, that will continue to elevate us up to uh, the, 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 I guess you would, you would say uh, the, the white status uh, in America where we have uh, uh, rights and privileges and uh, membership in, the, in, in, the, in America just as they do. Uh, so everyone is, is fighting to be equal. Uh, we don't like the inequality in terms of uh, the white status and the white race having uh, privilege uh, and birthrights that they're born with and the classified black uh, uh, race status not necessarily having the same rights, privileges, and, and membership that we have to fight for those uh, civil rights, voting rights. So uh, lending voice to all of that and, and making change is what we're really trying to do. Thank you so much, Mr. Thomas. Um, and again, thank you all um, for, for agreeing to serve as panelists and, 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 and working to make this first um, portion of, of what will be an extensive series throughout seven states across the Southeast um, happen. It's been, certainly it's been enlightening for me and I hope it's been the same for those who are listening in. So thank you all very much. Um, there was an additional question that came in from Keith Toussaint and talks about how religious leaders could, could um, continue this movement and inspire others, encourage others who are giving up hope and, and acting from anger. I hope that the charge will answer that question um, here to give us a charge and to wrap us wrap up our event is none other than um, someone who I consider to be be one of my mentors and has been a mentor to so many over his uh, 41 years at, at Morehouse College um, is none other than the Reverend Dr. Dean Lawrence Edward Carter Sr. Dean, go ahead and take us away. You have to unmute yourself first. Though. Gotta unmute yourself, Dean. <laughs> there we go. And, uh, Unmute it. Well, I have thoroughly enjoyed listening to all of you. I think you've all uh, hit the ball out of the park. <laughs> and so I took some notes, and I think from the things I've written down, I'll be able to give you a charge. But before I do, I'm going to give out an assignment to all of the chapel assistants. This semester that we're in, during this time, I want you to find out why the appreciation of African Americans for the help we received from the Jewish community was so significant in the 20th century that we named the highest honor that we confer after a member of the Jewish community. African-Americans created the Spingarn Medal, named after a Jewish citizen who worked for many years in the NAACP with his brother. Find out who those two men were and what they did. And that is just barely the tip of the iceberg of how great has been the contribution of the Jewish community to African Americans. The partnership and alliance between African Americans and Israeli Americans, our blacks and Jews, was historically a necessary and powerful model of sustainable cooperation. Sustainability is a synonym for justice. If it's not sustainable, it is not just. Our ancestors have a lot to teach us about cooperation. And that is what the Shared Legacies documentary tells us quite powerfully. The shared responsibility to repair 
the harms of slavery, segregation, the Holocaust, and anti-Semitism rest first with African Americans and Jewish people. Isaiah Thomas is correct. Communal self-love was the motivating force and the chief organizing principle supporting and affirming African Americans and Jewish acceptance of shared responsibility for repairing the damage to the personhood of both communities. Many white Americans are full of fear toward African Americans and Jewish Americans. When you're fearful, you've chosen wrongly. Prejudice, racism, and anti-Semitism are full of fear. And fear is the enemy of freedom and democracy. Fearful people must change their minds, which will transform their behavior. This is a matter of willingness to learn, listen, dialogue, and visit He who never visits thinks his mother is the best cook. <laughs> Fear is a divine alarm clock. It is the indicator that we are believing something that is not true. It is a wake up call and our reminder to choose truth. Fear is pain pushing us to choose healing. And so, putting in what Abraham Lincoln left out, we need governments of all of the people, by all of the people, and for all of the people. The ultimate norm of decisions is love, nothing else. Love and justice are the same. For justice is love equally distributed, said Martin Luther King. Only one thing is intrinsically good. namely love, nothing else. Love wills the neighbor's good, whether we like him or her or not. The only in, only the in justifies the means, nothing else. Only the end justifies the means, nothing else. Decisions ought to be made situationally, not prescriptively. The goal is to be moral cosmopolitans. 
which simply means do not let your morality get hijacked by bigotry, hatred, sexism, homophobia, anti-Semitism, racism, xenophobia, ableism, or violence. And I'm stopping for your sake. Again, thank you so much, Dean. Um, that was, as always, those of us who've been in, in the chapel and, and have attended chapel services know that Dean has a way of wrapping up events um, and in the most eloquent speech, um, I think you've given us quite the charge. Um, and, and, and I think I can speak on behalf of those on the call, those of us who are younger, we're looking forward to taking forth um, that charge and, and carrying the torch into the future. Um, again, to our panelists, thank you. And, and I'll turn, turn this over to my colleague, Blake, who'll wrap things up for us. I wanted to say one thing. I wanted to thank Dean Carter. Um, just your words of wisdom, you brought tears to my eyes and I can't thank you enough for what you've done um, in honor of Dr. King's legacy at Morehouse. I feel so honored. I feel honored to meet you. I, I look forward to working more with you and I, I'm just blessed and we're all blessed to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. On to that, we, um, on behalf of myself, Spill the Honey Foundation, hopefully the consulate in Morehouse, we can't thank everyone enough for being here. For, from my opinion, this was probably one of the most inspiring panels I've ever been a part of. Maybe I'm biased because I'm moderating, but I really thought it was unbelievable. Um, and in the beginning film that we showed you, that four or five minute clip, whatever it was, my, my part at the end, that wasn't scripted. We weren't like, I wasn't like just saying become a Spill the Honey ambassador because it was, you know, someone was telling me to do so. It's so important that you guys reach out to me or anyone for that matter in this panel area to get involved. Like this is such an important time right now in terms of black and Jewish relations and it's an inflection point and we need your help. So well, I'll end it off that unless Wendell has any uh, oh, closing. I was just say, well, we're gonna definitely follow up in our follow up email to all of you and, and share contact information for how you can get involved with Spill the Honey. We'll also share information about what the consulate's doing and, and Morehouse and, and the Andrew Young um, Foundation um, as well as how to get in, 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 um, involved in the work that the temple and Ebenezer are doing as well. Um, so be on the lookout for that message. All right, again, thank you all for joining us and you all have a great night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right, thanks. thanks. Peace, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Ambassador Young was amazing. This is an amazing panel, just unreal.